Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by Fred and Lou Hartwig and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, that weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly to discuss, did everything really change after 9-11? A big change in the Kansas U.S. Senate race. And does a Missouri senator want to change jobs? But first, our Ruckus headliner, former city councilman and maybe the next mayor of Kansas City, Missouri, Dan Coffrin. Mr. Coffrin ran for the job in 1995, winning the majority of votes in four of the six districts, but losing the overall count to then Mayor Emanuel Cleaver. Since leaving the council, the potential candidate has been active in the city's civic life, serving as chairman of the Citizens Association. Dan Coffrin, a pleasure to welcome you to the Ruckus program. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Mr. Shannon. So, Dan, have you decided yet? Are you going to run for mayor? No, I've not decided yet. Uh, I'm taking about uh, 60 days, basically September and October, to look at the race uh, as to whether it might make some sense. Uh, uh, I had been uh, frustrated with uh, things going on at City Hall the last few years, thinking they were a little out of touch. What, what is it that frustrates you that's going on at City Hall? Uh, I, I think uh, in, in, in local government, the focus should be basic city services. The job of local government is to provide quality basic services for fair and reasonable taxes based on responsible spending decisions. Isn't that why city governments were created in the first place? I'm thinking so, yes. <laughs> but uh, in recent years, I'm afraid we've uh, not uh, distinguished between needs and wants, and we've been spending too much time and attention and money on wants, things like the streetcar, uh, a new airport terminal, uh, things like that, when we really don't have time to be wasting on those. Yeah, what about the Sprint Center, though, and the Power and Light District? Are those appropriate actions for city government to be dealing with? Uh, those are closer calls, quite frankly. Uh, the Sprint Center, uh, luckily, is paying for itself, as I understand. Uh, however, the Power and Light District... Because of taxation. Yeah, because, well, it's a fee on car right, rentals, right. right. On the other hand, uh, the Power and Light District, uh, I have some problems with that, quite frankly, uh, because when that was approved, it was pretty clear that the uh, taxes it was going to throw off would not be sufficient to pay off the TIF bonds. And so right now, the city has to dip into the general fund uh, well in excess of 10 or $12 million a year to help pay off the debt on that. And I think uh, Kansas City has uh, gone on something of a debt binge for quite some time. Our level of debt in Kansas City is significantly in excess of the rest of the country, and we need to get that under control. Well, I don't so, want to cause you any problems, but you're sounding a bit like Mark Funkhauser used to sound. Well, I know Mark Funkhauser, and quite frankly, I like Mark Funkhauser, but uh, uh, I, uh, there's some differences between me and Mark. No, 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 but I mean, in terms of looking at the fiscal picture well, yeah, for Kansas City absolutely. And, and I mean, budgetary items. We have to look at why yeah, I mean, are He we warned here? about the power and light district costing 12 to $14 million a year from the general yeah, fund. And he was absolutely correct. It seemed that way to me. Uh, it, well, the, the tax revenues were not going to be sufficient, and if we would be applying that 12 to 13 million dollars a year for basic services, whether it's police officers or cleaning up neighborhoods, cutting weeds, the things that people expect their tax dollars to be spent on, I think we'd be uh, much better off. So, if you want a downtown today, it's probably fair to say in older urban areas like you know downtown Kansas City, downtown St. Louis, whatever, you probably have to pay for your downtown if you want it to be uh, active. Question is, how much? Well, what about a, a hotel downtown? We hear talk of a thousand room hotel which would complete the picture. Conventions would come here in greater number. It would be a public-private partnership costing taxpayers some money. Absolutely. I opposed that back when I was in the city council. There was a proposal from it's the It's been Pro going on that long. Yeah, huh? it surfaced again. <laughs> it comes up every 10 or 15 years. And uh, if it comes up, my view would be the same, uh, that that's not the sort of thing taxpayer dollars sh should be spent on. Uh, your perception is probably a lot better than mine, but people I hear from suggest that Sly James is a very popular mayor, very personable He's omnipresent. He's at all these events uh, promoting Kansas City. Do you get a different read of how people regard Sly James? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, I agree. Sly is very personable. He seems to be everywhere at once. Uh, he's got good style, if you will. Uh, but taxpayers are more interested in substance than style. Uh, if you look at the most recent citizen satisfaction survey done just this year for Kansas City, which is done most years now, 
uh, people are very disappointed uh, in the level of services we get in Kansas City. Uh, it shows that uh, in almost every category, uh, the level of satisfaction that is respondents who say they're satisfied or very satisfied uh, is down in the 50% ranges, 60% ranges, and even lower. That's D's and F's if we're in school. If you decide to run and you say you'll decide in October, November time frame, was, right. that, was that your thought? Uh, if you decide to run and somebody on television or radio says, what's the main reason you'll tell people vote for me, don't vote for Sly James, what do you think that reason will be? Uh, that I would focus 110% uh, on quality basic services throughout the city. Uh, more specifically, uh, my top priority would be dealing with the causes of crime and poor school performance. Uh, one area that I differ from uh, many other people is in the case of schools, for example, they say that's the school district's problem or, or, or job. Uh, not really. They start at age five when a child enters kindergarten. The reason we have problems with crime in Kansas City uh, as well as uh, poor school performance uh, actually relates to what happens in a child's life much earlier. Basically, little kids growing up in low-income neighborhoods are behind the curve. Uh, when they show up for kindergarten, and we need to get really serious about that. Dan Coffrin, good to see you again. Thanks very much for coming by. Good luck in your campaign. As always, thank you. That is uh, Dan Coffrin, a potential candidate for mayor of Kansas City, Missouri. The election, the primary is in April of next year, the general in June 2015. Now, let's go start a ruckus. Well, everyone is assembled, so let's meet the ruckets. Yale Abahaka is an editorial writer with the Kansas City Star. Cynthia Wheeler is a media strategist. Lisa Johnson is a co Johnston. I'm, I said your name wrong. <laughs> Lisa, well, this is your first time here. Lisa Johnston is a columnist and political consultant. And of course, Woody Kozad is president of the Kozad Company, a government relations firm. A special welcome to Lisa and Cynthia here on your first appearance with the Ruckus Panel. Well, if Senator Roberts wants to keep his job, he can't stand Pat. A big shakeup in the Kansas campaign as the Democratic nominee Chad Taylor drops out and attention turns to the independent running, Olathe businessman Greg Orman. Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach says Taylor's name will stay on the ballot because of technical and legal errors in Taylor's withdrawal application. That's going to the state Supreme Court. Orman has been doing fairly well in polls, and some think he poses a serious threat to Roberts. So what do the Democrats do now? Back Orman? Back Taylor if his name remains on the ballot? Lisa was the party's nominee in 2010. So you tell us, what do Kansas Democrats do now in this situation? Well, honestly, I think they need to come to terms with the fact that their 11th hour attempt at strategy probably isn't going to work out as they intended and move to plan B, which I think is to encourage the base to back Orman. Orman does have a chance. The most recent poll showed him up by one point. Now, I will say the debate last weekend at the state fair did underscore what a political underdog Orman is, being uh, brand new to politics. And there are a few things that I think he needs to do right away. One is to uh, absolutely banish the phrase, I agree with Senator <laughs> Roberts, <laughs> from his vocabulary. Uh, he does not want to brand himself as Roberts Light. This is not going to be favorable for him, and it's not going to get him votes in November. He also needs a stronger, more well-defined message, aside from, I want to solve problems, and Washington is broken. And then in a race this close, optics do really matter. And I believe he needs to work with a voice coach as his speaking style is quite nasal. And you'd be available. Oh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> did the party essentially force him out, the party hierarchy? I don't know. I was not privy to the discussions that went on. I do know what I do know, and I'm well, sure most of you know. Why else would he drop out? I mean, Claire McCaskill, of course, has said publicly that she met with him. I do think that there was pressure put upon him to do that once the polling came out showing the head-to-head -head matchups between he and Roberts and Roberts and Orman. And it was clear that in, in that head-to-head, -head, Orman was performing much better. So there's clear that there was pressure. I don't know how Taylor felt about it. I, I would guess that he might have had some concerns or misgivings about that, but I think he tried to do what the party wanted. Yale, I believe you wrote about the debate uh, between mm -hmm. uh, Roberts and Orman. What were your conclusions? Um, I semi-agree on somebody saying, I agree so often, but 
obviously he has to show that if he's independent, well, he is going to agree with the Republican Party sometime. Because if you look like you're a Democrat running against Pat Roberts, then he will just ramp up the, well, see, he never agrees with me in anything. He must be a Democrat. Now, Roberts is already going to do that, so he's going to continue to do that. But I think Orman, with a few times of saying, well, now, Pat and I agree on this, and then go into where he'd be different on five other issues. Uh, the second thing is, as far as style and actually substance, he needs to bring more substance, I do agree. But you're also running against an insubstantial candidate. I mean, Pat Roberts is 15 or 20 years past his prime. He really doesn't have as, much, as good a connection as he once did, certainly with the Kansas, um, you know, the Kansas people. Yeah, but he practices Senate speech well, and get he into does, the and, weeds and, on and, things that you know. That but are he hard also he to. also has this thing where, and he got away with. I thought the debate. I thought he actually did a decent job in the debate of joking and this and that. But uh, overall, Orman has a chance, and, the, and Chad Taylor's right to get out. He had no money, and he had no personality. Cynthia, this race has national implications, does it not? Yes, it does. And um, for those of us sitting and watching it from the national sideline and, and traveling around the country and working with other folks, they're paying close attention to what we're doing. I, I'm, a, I'm an advocate for Orman, but I, I do have to speak from a media strategist perspective that um, Kansans are comfortable with what they know. And it's a close race. And I see Orman's uh, image kind of presenting problems for him and Robert's history may carry him. And Woody, Republicans are really poised to take control of the Senate yep. uh, after the midterms, and uh, certainly Roberts being in a tight race was not part of the calculations. No, it wasn't. Uh, Democrats have the same problem in a couple of races that they thought they had locked up. But uh, this one was not in their calculations. Part of that has to do with the fact that the National Senate Republican Campaign Committee is pretty much out of touch with actual, what actually goes on in the state and what perceptions are out there. You know, they made a fiasco out of the Senate race over here by getting Bruner to run uh, and thereby nominating Todd Aiken, uh, which wasn't their plan. Uh, so I, I think, uh, yeah, this, this causes them to spend money where they weren't going to spend money, put a lot of effort where they weren't going to put a lot of effort. Uh, I think their strategy has to be a lot of this joking stuff that you talk about with Roberts. They've got to remind people of why they like Pat Roberts that he's a good guy, and then say, before you fire him, shouldn't you know who this guy is? Mm -hmm. And that's, to me, that's your campaign. In the history in of Kansas, 29 senators have been Republicans, three have been Democrats, two have been populist. Not yet have we had an independent elected senator from the state of Kansas. Well, there's speculation that Missouri Senator Claire McCaskill is toying with the idea of running for governor in 2016, but what would such a decision cost her? The state attorney general, Chris Coster, is already in the running, and both he and McCaskill are Democrats. McCaskill ran as the party's gubernatorial nominee in 2004, losing to Matt Blunt, son of the other Missouri senator, Roy Blunt. Let's start with a question. Is this just idle speculation, or might it have some real substance, Yale? A captain. Well, I think it does, depends a little bit on whether McCaskill uh, is in the minority party in about six months. That's part of it. Um, I think she'd be a great governor. Uh, she's gotten a lot of attention on the national stage, but it's not like she lives for that and is going to run for president, as she you know, told uh, Rachel Maddow last week, she's not going to run for president. So, okay, so you're in the Senate. And look who came back and has been a damn effective government, governor, Sam Brownback, in getting his plan passed. Now, it's a horrible plan in Kansas, but if you, have a, gov if you have a governor <laughs> who has real power to turn a state around, and this and the state of Missouri is going downhill fast, fast in you know in all kinds of uh, financial issues and certainly in um, you know abortion issues and gun issues, things like that. McCaskill would be a real leader in turning the state around. Uh, comma, however, you asked if it's idle speculation. Yeah, I think it's a silly season. So all things are possible. You know, in two years, if there's still a majority party, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't see why she would want to do it. You're in the Senate. And you you, you mentioned the, the Rachel Maddow interview on mm -hmm. MSNBC, uh, the very liberal talk show host yeah. had Claire McCaskill as a guest. Mm -hmm. And uh, if Claire has aspirations beyond governor of Missouri, she must have loved this conversation. I'd be asking you if you're running for president. You know, it's just kind of an <laughs> awkward, awful question. If I were you, I would be running. As the most, really? If, as the most centrist senator in the state, the way that you've run in Missouri, the issue of, you. if I had to pick one Democrat who I thought uh, could definitely win a race for president, uh, it would be you.
What do you think about that, uh, Lisa? Do you think she's real embarrassed by that interview? Oh, I don't think she's embarrassed at all. I'm sure she loved it. Uh, you know, as to the question about whether or not she'll run for governor, I think she'll test the political winds at the time. I think we need to keep in mind that it won't necessarily be a cakewalk for her in 2012. Her reelection was very much in question until the Todd She likely Aiken would not debacle. have won, uh, I think, if, if Todd Aiken hadn't made some of the remarks he made. Exactly. But with uh, Senator McCaskill, I frankly wonder, she's been such an early and vocal advocate for, for Hillary Clinton yeah. for president, and I wonder in the back of my mind if she might have on her short list a possibility of a cabinet position. Yeah. If, uh, and maybe Clinton the presidency elected. down the road. Maybe the presidency down the road, but I do think that they're more more likely we're going to see aspirations for a cabinet position. I really do. I don't. I, I think she's a great example of uh, being able to move pat move into the center. But I do think that president is not. She was probably no, not, fired, not, though. Not this year. <laughs> but what, what do you, uh, who are some of the people the Republican Party is thinking about for governor in, in 2016? Uh, two of them. And one of them is the state auditor, who has the misfortune not to even have an opponent this year. And nobody knows his name. And when the election's over, they still won't know his name because he doesn't have an opponent. What is his name? Tom Schweik. And the other Yale is, knew his name. The other is Catherine Hannaway. Yeah. Uh -huh. And... Uh, Catherine uh, be a formidable candidate, I believe. If, and look, if Claire doesn't get in to this race and Costa runs on, uh, in the Democratic primary unopposed, I think there are a fair number of people who mistakenly, in my opinion, believe then Costa's in. Mm -hmm. And that may make it hard for a Republican to raise money. If she gets in this race, the Republicans are going to start getting their checkbooks out. And, and getting serious about this governor. And Woody, in about 30 seconds, can you review for us the uh, veto session that is in the <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you how they, uh, I'll, I'll just leave it to the Speaker of the House who was tweeting on the following, hashtag Nixon's bad day. And that's pretty well it. Uh, in, since the Civil War, we've had uh, eight vetoes overridden. Counting the line items, he had 50 yesterday. Uh, take the line items out, he still had 10 more than the total since the Civil War. Yeah, a couple so of headlines. A good day for said him. Missouri enacts 72-hour abortion waiting right. period. Uh, Missouri lawmakers expand guns in schools and cities. Despite and those, the are, the, those of, are the of highly partisan things. Genes. Take yeah. a look at some of the other stuff he vetoed. It's amazing. You're looking at it. Two of them were sponsored by African-American female senators of his party. And they're, uh, there's nothing controversial about them. And he vetoes them. And those two no. ladies are in there voting against no, him on let, nearly let, every veto. But you're cherry picking there. Thank You've you. really got to go to the big issues. And the big issues were guns and abortion. Yep. And, and, and the people of Missouri spoke through their legislature. We want this kind of backward state. All right. And we need 30 uh, plus right. vetoes, it's folks. We've got to move it ain't on. just two. Uh, 13 years ago this day, politicians and pundits said 9 11 changes everything. The way political campaigns are conducted, the way we deal with our political process, we will come together as we have in previous times when the nation's security was at stake. And for a short while, we did. Today, however, the polls show steep polarization, low approval ratings for the president, even lower for Congress, and a belief that the country is moving dramatically in the wrong direction. What happened? What went wrong? Who's to blame? Or what's to blame? Well, I'd save an easy first question for you, Cynthia. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate the easy first question. It's unfortunate. It's 9-11, and it's been kind of a quiet morning, I'm sure, for many of us. But I do believe that a lot changed. We lost our innocence. And when you really think about it, we lived in a society that had, um, we watched wars from afar and never thought that we'd see that kind of action in our own backyard. So we, we have no... Uh, um, privacy anymore a lot of I mean you know you go we have no privacy anymore? we have no privacy anymore I mean come on Uncle Sam's watching so is Google who I love by the way <laughs> uh, but yes I think we lost our innocence and I've seen lots of changes has has it relates to the polarization issue um, I can't say that it's Democrats or Republicans or it's the media's fault I think the Pew Institute just recently published some uh, research and polling that they did regarding partisanization. However, I think that we all contribute to it in our own way, and people are digging their heels in. And I think last night in Missouri was an example of where this country is moving, and in my opinion, it's the wrong way. Yale, when did this polarization that we experience now over the past 13 years, when do you think it started? When Barack Obama was elected president. 
Yeah, Not, uh, what about no. when Bush was president? No, I think uh, Bush was president, and it was, and some of the war stuff was was bad. But I think you know, subsequent to that, when everybody found out Bush was a liar, that really, uh, I mean, or I think that really hurt his presidency, and it hurt, and it hurt the, they hurt the image of the president. It's hurt Barack Obama as well. Barack Obama looks like a liar to many people, and I think, it were, and you know, the you lie stuff, all that stuff, were much more capable of yelling at somebody. But if you, uh, you know, you kind of asked well, what has changed, yeah. and I'll just very right. quickly, Did two worst, two worst, the terrorist won. Okay. Uh, we've lost the privacy, you know, all the airline stuff, all this stuff, the terrorist won, and we've done exactly what they would have wanted us to do. Well, here 13 years later, we're still worried about terrorists. This time it's a new terrorist organization or an right. offshoot of Al Qaeda called ISIS or ISIL. And the president went on primetime radio and television last night to uh, talk about what was going to happen, and he offered this view. Our objective is clear. We will degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL through a comprehensive and sustained counterterrorism strategy. Believe him on that point, Lisa? Well, I certainly believe that that's going to be the desire and the effort, but it's certainly not going to be a simple undertaking. And I think what he laid out was fairly expected and fairly boilerplate. And obviously, it's, it's a, a step in the right direction, but I, I think it would be going too far as to say that it's, it's a plan that will completely annihilate ISIL. Uh, we're going to have to see how things go. We're going to have to build this coalition. And frankly, I'd like to see them attack the financial resources of the group. I think that's going to be very important to uh, crushing them. We've come a long way for Barack Obama from the time he ran for president, uh, staying out of all wars, pulling uh, forces out of Iraq and Afghanistan. Now we have airstrikes going on in Iraq and Syria, Woody. Do you think, even though the president keeps saying no boots on the ground, that we may end up with U.S. boots on the ground? No, I don't. I think he's serious about that. Uh, I, I think he's got that, that's a fixation with him. And it will be a fixation with him sometime when it's a really bad idea not to have boots on the ground. He still won't do it. Uh, and, and if, if uh, Bush was too ready to go to war, this guy is too rigidly opposed to ever getting himself into one. He's got another agenda, and foreign policy, period, isn't part of it. I mean, it just isn't. And yeah, he as, as far as he's concerned, president. this whole thing's a distraction. Yeah. And that's, that's what he wants to work on. Uh, you know, he asked what changed. I, I, there's something I want to say. I've always been struck by the fact that run on, in the run-up of the Civil War, the last presidents were Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, and James Buchanan. And, and the presidents we've had since Reagan left office are George H.W. Bush, Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama. And everybody's entitled to his own opinion. I don't think that's a stellar group. <laughs> All right, it is time now for Roast and Toast, where we celebrate or excoriate people and events in the news. Now, Forrest Holdeman is among loyal Ruckus fans who are roasting KCPT for changing Roast and Toast and he says, you should go back to the panelists and listen to them. They are leaders in the community. Reading remarks of unknown people is not very interesting. Okay, Forrest, <laughs> this week we'll do it your way, and we will start with Woody. Uh, I'd like to roast Dan Coffrin uh, for that interview I heard at the top <laughs> of the show uh, for part of it, for, where he clearly says that, that the present mayor, who, of whom I'm not the world's greatest admirer, isn't doing anything about basics in the city. And that's not true. They've, the mayor has devoted a lot of money to basics. And he's, raised, he's gotten the voters to raise taxes, in the name of all that's holy, for streets, for example. Uh, so, yeah, he's paying attention to a lot of glitz. But to say he's not doing the basics is not fair to the mayor. Yeah. Um, ditto. Double ditto on what he just said, because a big, big roast of Dan Coffin for trying to mislead people of Kansas City. However, a very quick roast of Tim Jones, who last night said, hey, you know, I'll bet, I'll bet they could actually, women could uh, Identify Tim thing. Jones. Tim was Speaker of the Missouri House, the powerful Speaker of the Missouri House. And he said, hey, I'll bet if all the men left, the women could pass stuff here, they could pass that abortion bill. No, they wouldn't. There are only like 35 or 38 of them in the House. Nothing would have passed without the men being there, subjecting the women to their will. Lisa Johnston. <laughs> My roast goes out to some members of Congress on both sides of the aisle who have complained and resisted a vote about inter
intervening regarding ISIL. Leadership was the job that they were elected to do, which means stepping forward and proclaiming what you think is right for the nation. And if they're not willing to do that, they need to step aside and make way for those who have enough courage to lead this nation. Cynthia. Oh, I struggled with this. I am going to toast our fantastic mayor, Sly James, <laughs> for having the um, um, conscience to pull together a group of folks and stand against um, the Senate and make a public announcement about what's appropriate for his own backyard. As we brag about Republicans saying that um, cities should govern themselves, we watched a state legislator tell a city it couldn't. And finally, a toast to the Ruckus viewers who have stopped me at the Sylvester Powell Community Center at various dining locations, all right, maybe even at a bar or two, to report what they like or don't like about the revamp program. All have been polite. Several have offered constructive thoughts. Now, for some of those emails I've received, well, that's a different story, uh, maybe for another time. We encourage viewers to contribute to this segment. To submit your roast or toast, you can contact us in whatever manner you prefer with the information at the bottom of the screen. That's Ruckus for this week. We're away next week, but back the following Thursday. Thanks for watching, and good night.